Hamlets. And in winter, it was in 1945, in January, they opened the door um, and Lenz told us five people out. Uh, then I was the youngest. Uh, I also ran. I I didn't even uh, put on my uh, trousers. I just had my ten pants and singlet. And there was another boy from Czechoslovakia. He was a doctor. Uh, he got some sort of a shock. He began singing and dancing. And Lenzig asked Hans Portman where to put us. And Portman said a bit further from here and he told us that we should lie down uh, we lie, uh, lay down the uh, first five and when we were thus lying uh, I heard some sort of a noise and then I was uh, hit I heard bullets whizzing by and I was hit by one of the bullets the scar of this bullet here the witness shows the scar. <laughs> On the bullet entered through the nape of his neck and came out through the mouth. The witness shows the court the scar left on his neck. I was still lying down. I was lying down and he would pass by. And when he heard some signs of life, uh, there were all sorts of uh, movements, so he would finish them off at the second shot. After the a uh, few minutes, I regained my consciousness, and when he passed by, I stopped breathing so that he should think that I'm dead. I was just lying there, and then there was another group of five. They shot them, and then the third group of five in turn, and they were also shot, and there was one soldier who was uh, um, just uh, guarding the uh, groups of dead people and uh, uh, to finish off those who still showed signs of life. Then I ran away. I ran away uh, when his gaze was not fixed on me. Um, I uh, was uh, hiding in the hut of a uh, Gentile up to the liberation when the Russians came. Uh, I was uh, looking through a um, hole in a um, stable. I thought it was a dream. I didn't know what was going on. Uh, somebody came in, opened the door and said to me, you can now go out. The Russians had already arrived. Then I went out and the Russian commander came. The Russian commander who had captured Dombia together with the physician uh, and he said that uh, uh, there is no chance uh, in the spine uh, for me uh, that I could only survive for about 12 or 24 hours they thought that the uh, bullet had uh, broken my spine uh, afterwards after 36 hours I was still alive in spite of the product the prediction then they realized that I had got the bullet uh, rather far from the um, spine were also wounded in the nose you have a scar near yes the I nose. had two scars and then I asked the physicians uh, they said that I when I received the bullet then instinctively I put the head down and somehow or other the bullet uh, didn't uh, get um, there was uh, some sort of uh, glass that splinter that uh, um, hit me What happened to your mother, Mr. Srebnik? 
Uh, I uh, was examining all sorts of files and also when I was uh, uh, taking out the uh, golden teeth from the corpses then I m saw one file and in this file I saw my mother's photograph Mr. Strebnik, this wound on the nape of your neck, does it still yes. bother you? Yes. And did you forget what no. you went through? No. Uh, I don't sleep at nights. I can't sleep well at nights. Uh, uh, those uh, horrid pictures are still haunting me. President of Court, Dr. Savatius, any questions? Dr. No, Savatius, I, I have no questions, no, no, Your no, no, Honor. No, no, no. Um, already in Israel, did you build a model? Did you make a model which was the exact replica of the camp and it is now in the Ghetto Fighters Museum? Yes, that's where it is. In the Question. Of phone, and a photograph of that model is that uh, photograph which is now here against the wall? Is that a photograph of the model which is now in the Ghetto Fighters Museum of the model which you yourself built? Is that right? It is an exact photocopy of it, a photograph of it, indeed. Question. Now, could you tell the court what is the what is it that is shown on this picture? This was the entrance. The witness is now pointing to a big photograph against the wall. This was the entrance. Here is where they stopped them. And here, between these two barracks. Here, the women were taken to the left. And the men... First, the people were brought from the entrance between the two barracks. The women were taken to this barrack, as I have pointed out here. Mr. Hausner, if the court will permit, I understand it is possible to set up a microphone where the witness is standing near these, this photograph. It will make it easier to hear what he is saying. President of Court, if it can be set up immediately, why not? Mr. Hausner, can we hold the microphone right next to the witness so everyone will hear what he is saying? Mr. Hausner, I see there are some technical difficulties. Maybe we can go ahead. Now, we said that the women went into one barrack, and the, the women into one, and the men into the other. Ah, the men, you said, stayed in, one, in the same place. It is very difficult to hear what the witness is saying because he is not speaking into the microphone.
what happened to the women. Mr. Hausner, these were the gas chambers. They had two gas chambers here and three gas chambers here. These were the three. The witness is pointing to a point on the photograph. Red thirteen and kickstop. What was this? Witness. In the big barracks, they cut off the women's hair, then they were taken to the gas chambers, and the witness is pointing to a building which had three, another building had ten gas chambers. They closed the doors, and the whole thing took about 40 to 45 minutes. President of court, uh, perhaps we should interrupt. You can identify only part of the sketch. Do you identify the uh, part uh, uh, on, um, during which you passed? Yes, I do. Uh, perhaps it is easier when you can see the second picture, then you can compare the two sketches. Yes, we have a moving microphone, I suppose uh, it can be moved this way. The train entered the camp through this entrance. Here and in the direction uh, through a gate, there was a platform. And from the platform, we walked towards the gate. There was a fence with a gate right here. There was a courtyard. There was a well nearby with two guards. Move a little, uh, says the president of court. These are the two huts which were in the courtyard, and there was a well nearby. I am almost sure that this was how it looked. Here there was a garage where they would repair automobiles. Here, later, they put up huts for us to live in. And there were also workshops. Here, the workshops were right here. How was that part of the camp called where you stayed? Um, this was marked by what number? This was Treblinka 1 or 2? This was camp number 1. And the second part of it? And the other part uh, was called number two. two. So you were in Treblinka 1? Yes. And then you arrived at the platform. And what happened to you in, when you were standing close to the platform? As I said before, the uh, doors of the train were opened and we were ordered to uh, come off the train with our belongings. Some of us were killed in the train and on the platform, those who were not in time to get off. When we all... Uh, gathered again in the courtyard, we were made to run double speed towards the uh, courtyard uh, where the huts are. Near the gate, uh, there were SS men and Ukrainians, <coughs> and in fact, the selection started right here. Women were sent to the left, men to the right. Yes. I did not want to leave my mother so soon. 
but near the gate I was hit on my head. I believe it was with a stick and I fell to the ground. I got up immediately. I did not want to uh, get more beatings of that stick and then my did mother was not with then? me anymore. I never you saw didn't her, see her again. Ever since. <clears throat> How many young people were there in your transport? When we entered the camp, out of the whole transport, 400 men were selected. 200 were left in one camp and 200 young men were sent to the uh, camp where the gas chambers uh, existed. I didn't know at that time, but I learned about it later. Uh, could you tell us something about the so-called Lazaret? Uh, yes. something in connection with the lazarette uh, immediately on your arrival I see the lazarette uh, this is where the lazarette was exactly at the end of the uh, camp the lazarette was a kind of grave or big dugout fenced off by barbed wire and near the entrance there was a hat painted white uh, with red crosses on it and uh, the inscription Lazarette on the walls. We do not see it here from the sketch. No, there is only a number here, a number 10, I believe. And the people who were killed here on this uh, platform when we arrived, or those who fainted, uh, still were alive but could not walk, we had to drag them to the lazarette. Uh, cynically, they called it lazarette as if the people were being taken to a doctor. But there was a large dugout. We had to throw the corpses into this grave. Even those who were alive, they would be shot and thrown into the dugout. You could and once I remember, one of the commanders in the camp called Kurt Franz, he was an Untersturmführer. Uh, he was Obersturmführer at first and then he uh, was promoted. He carried out a search on uh, this, uh, on the body of this uh, doctor and found some money on him. Franziski knew immediately what to expect because those on whom money was found, they would be shot down. Do you know why he was keeping this money? He was one of the men who or was preparing to take part in the uprising, money. and that is why he had money on him. Khoronjitsky knew what to expect, so he attacked Kurt Franz, although the doctor was older and Kurt Franz was young, but he managed to run away. Khoronjitsky uh, left the hut, but he fell. It seemed that he took some poison which he had on him. All the inmates and internees were called to a roll call, and they had to see how they treated Kharonjitsky to revive him. Kurt Franz and uh, an Ukrainian dragged Khoronjitsky's tongue out and caught Franz, poured water into his mouth, and then he jumped onto his belly, jumping with his boots to clean his stomach from the poison he had taken. And then two men had to lift Khoronjitsky by his feet so that the water would come out through the mouth. They repeated this a number of times but they did not succeed and then he was undressed, he was whipped and then sent to the lazarette. Rising. At the uprising was supposed to begin at four in the afternoon 
and at 2 30 the children the two young boys were supposed to enter the uh, munitions shed and they did enter and uh, brought a number of hand grenades pistols and munitions at the very same time two men entered into the uh, living quarters the hut they were caught they were undressed they found money on these two men they were caught by one of the commanders of the camp he undressed them and started whipping them this was uh, about half an hour before the uh, time scheduled for the uprising so that uh, there was chaos people would come and go and uh, and say that there were informers who already informed or were about to inform there was nothing to lose the uprising should start immediately but most of us knew that this was to start at four but as far as I know I was told later that this man Rudik shot the SS man who was whipping the two men he undressed. Then a hand grenade was thrown. You said that was in the beginning. Yes. And after this uh, alarm, there was a man who used to carry out the disinfection of the Ukrainian huts. He had a hose and would uh, spread this disinfectant into the huts. On that day, he was supposed to change the liquid to something combustible, to petrol or benzene. There was a large tank with fuel nearby. And this was, they set fire to this hut. This exploded and the flames spread. There were leaves and branches all around the ghetto which caught fire. I, at the time, was in one of the workshops for aluminum sheets. I ran to the post I was supposed to come to, but I could not get there because of the fire. The uh, tank prevented my approach, so I ran in circles and ran towards the lazarette. And that's where you escaped from? Yes, I escaped from the lazarette. How did you break through the fence? I crossed the fence. There were people who uh, uh, succeeded in escaping before me, and uh, this was kind of easier for me. They did run after us, mounted on horses and with a car. But those who escaped had arms. I ran with a group. They had a rifle with them and pistols. They were shooting back at the Germans. The Germans retreated. That is how we succeeded in reaching the wood nearby. How many people will survive <laughs> Treblinka? How many men ran in my direction? I believe some 150 people. A parade. After the parade, we were again directed to these piles, something similar. Again, we had to classify articles, clothing, and so on. After some time, there appeared an SS man, Matthias, Sharfura Matthias, and shouted, 20 men, I want 20 volunteers. I was standing near him. I was afraid. I thought if I wouldn't... Uh, uh, volunteer he might uh, take revenge so I volunteered and he said you are going out to do some light work for 10 minutes and we were placed in camp 2 in the death camp where were you taken to we were taken in the direction of a camouflaged gate which was camouflaged with pine branches Look at the sketch on the wall. Can you identify the picture? What is this? 
That is the camp number two. This is the Treblinka camp, you say. Where were you taken from the gate? Can you show the court? Uh, uh, one moment, uh, please, until the microphone is set. You will please stand near the sketch on the other side so that the court can see the picture. Here at this spot, they had this camouflaged gate covered with pine branches. We were brought in here, and this is where we stopped at this point. And when they opened the gate, and we entered, then everyone automatically was shocked because we saw a pile of dead bodies at this very spot. And the Germans, this Matthias, began shouting at us. He said, Andy Tragen, which means, go get the stretchers, go get the stretchers. We did not know what he meant. We began running in circles around the bodies, and the Germans and the Ukrainians beat us and stabbed a few people, and we did not know what to take, what to do. And the Jews who had been working there in removing these bodies told us, uh, grab the stretchers and take bodies on the stretcher. So we each grabbed the stretcher. Myself and another friend took a stretcher, and we approached this pile to take a body on the stretcher. And we walked to the graves here. It is about 200, 150 meters, and we dumped the bodies into the grave. Now, can you show the court? Where did you live in Treblinka right, number two? Right here in this barrack, sir, the one I'm pointing to. You can return to the witness stand, please. But how deep was the grave where you threw the corpses? The depth, the depth of was seven or ten meters. It sloped, it had an incline, and the bodies rolled into it. And all days you were busy moving corpses. Yes, all day I worked in removing bodies from the gas chambers to the graves. And then you continued doing the same work? Uh, the work was uh, a little peculiar. When we came to work in the morning, uh, they divided us into groups. There were three types of work. There were the gas chambers and the transfer of corpses to the graves and then there was also the burning, the burning of the bodies. And on the first night, those who came with you could not stand the shock. What did they do? Yes, many hanged themselves with belts. They wound the belts around their throats and one person asked his, co his friend to s pull the chair off. One helped the other commit suicide, really. Did you see the whole process of extermination? Yes, I saw the whole process. Will you describe to the court briefly? The people arrived from that famous Judenstrasse, which led from one camp number one to camp number two. There they were, SS men were posted there, all the staff of camp two. They had dogs, whips, they had bayonets in their hands. The people walked calmly at first, of course, in 1942, in the summer. They did not know where they were being led. And when they entered the gas chambers, they stood near the entrance, and there were two Ukrainians near the entrance. One was Ivan, the other one was Nikolai, and they opened the gas. 
Where did the gas come from? The gas came from a diesel engine. Yes, from an engine. From an engine or was it brought from the outside, the gas? No, it was Ropa gas. It was called Ropa. It was being manufactured by a diesel motor. Yes, they put Ropa inside. Ropa is a kind of solar or, or yes, solar oil. And the fumes came out of a pipe which led into the gas chambers. And when the people entered into the gas chambers, the last ones were stabbed in their bodies by the bayonets which were held by these and the last people already saw what was happening they did not want to enter and they just jammed the people inside 400 into the small chamber and when they stabbed them the people just automatically of themselves were pushed inside and this formed the uh, the uh, this was the final capacity, the full capacity of the gas chamber and was so jam-packed that it was difficult to close the door and when they locked the door we were on the outside we heard only screams and Shema Israel prayers mother, father and after 35 minutes they were dead and two Germans were standing and they said everyone is asleep open the doors and we opened the doors and we took the bodies out Yes, I do. Please, Please place the skull cap on your head. Place your right hand on the Bible and repeat after me. I swear by God Almighty <coughs> that my testimony in this trial will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. <coughs> what is your full name, sir? David. Vdovinsky, W-D-O-W-I-N-S-K-I, doctor, answer yes, Vdovinsky. How do you spell that, sir? W-D-O-W-I-N-S-K-I. <laughs> you can be seated if it's always. You live in the United States now, Dr. Vdovinsky? Yes, I do. I understand. Uh, you are a professor of psychology and psychiatry at the New School for Social Research in New York? Correct. During the Second World War you were in Warsaw? Yes, from the beginning of it. And during the time of the uprising, you were the commander of the National Jewish Military Organization in Warsaw? Yes. And you took part in the general uprising until finally your bunker uh, fell. When was that? This was in the last uh, day of uh, the uprising, 1943. The, the last day of April, 1943. And all positions held by the Jewish National Organization had to surrender uh, then? There were still some outposts which were fighting according to the tidings I received 
at least uh, three weeks. Uh, they were still fighting for three weeks. I mean, some units. When you left the bunker and taken to the Umschaltplatz, did you see one of your positions then? Yes, I saw one of the out post in uh, Muranowski Square and also Muranowski Street, 8 and 9. A blue and white flag? They were still fighting on. I heard the shots. And from the Umschlagplatz, you were brought to carriages and you were brought to Lublin, I understand. Answer, next day we were taken there because we were waiting for about one day before we were taken. And then uh, I was brought together with uh, uh, the um, remainder of my family because part of it had already been killed in Treblinka as a result of the first action. Uh, uh, which was going on from July up to the Day of the Atonement, 1942. Then you were brought to the Maidana camp. Uh, answer, yes. Then they separated you from your uh, family, then you say from your uh, wife. Answer, yes, after three or four days. Where were you brought? Question, answer. I was brought together with 800 other Jews, actually 807 together with me, to a camp which was not far from Lublin, about 35 kilometers from Lublin. Budzin, the name was. Uh, they chose, selected 807 people. Answer, yes, uh, we were the remnants of the Warsaw jury. We were standing uh, near the gate there were various departments in Majdanek and they wanted to send us uh, uh, to one of the fields and all of a sudden an SS officer turned up. Later on we found out that this was Ober uh, Schanfira Reinhold's Fikes and he came together with uh, Ukrainians wearing black uniforms. Uh, he demanded from the local commander 807 Jews uh, because in his camp in Budin uh, there were 1,203. So in order uh, that his prestige be saved, he wanted to have exactly 2,000. He demanded exactly 807 men, and this is what he received. Yes, this is what he received. What did they do? In Budin, all the Jews almost, uh, uh, as this was a Jewish labor camp, these Jews were working for Flugzeugwerke, that means to say uh, a, factory, a factory, factory for aeroplane spare parts. What was the rule in this camp? Uh, the discipline is very difficult to describe. The, the, the system there, it beggars description. When we arrived at Budzin on the first day, it was the 30th of April or the 1st of May, I understand. The commander, Weitz, told us to stand in two lines. And later on, uh, he would come up to one Jew and told him to step out of the line and ordered him to undress. Then he began to undress. And then he began shouting at him, hurry up, uh, undress completely, until he was stuck naked. And then he took out a pistol and killed the Jew on the spot and said to him, this is what is going to happen to each one of you if you are not going to hand over everything you have got here with you and on you. This is only one example. Uh, he spoke about uh, money, uh, gold, suitcases. President of Court, what is the name Fikes. of this German? Fikes. Reinhold Fikes. 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 He was from Sudetenland. There was another case where he killed a man with his own hand. On the very same day, 
bad he like saw a that. man, an old man actually. Uh, uh, and he said, You are an old dog and you have survived, you are still alive. And he ordered the Ukrainians uh, to shoot him. And he helped them. And then we had to take him. Uh, we hid him actually and the Ukrainians uh, couldn't find him and the commander came back after half an hour to the camp and by chance saw that man and he whipped out his pistol and shot him dead. This was a doctor from Warsaw, extremely popular and beloved uh, by Warsaw Jory Dr. Hupko. First of all, he was very well known. He was a religious Jew. He would pray every day, would put on the phylacteries every day. On Saturdays, he wouldn't write any prescriptions. And he was also uh, loved because he did quite a lot as a Jew for, poor, for his poor brethren, and he would treat them without money. You worked as a doctor in that camp, in Buzin. In Buzin I worked as a doctor. And you had to take care of the order of those put to Yes, death. I had to supervise uh, the hygiene in the camp. Also to supervise the um, tombs, actually one tomb, the mass tomb. I had to see to it that it was always clean and uh, well, each time a Jew was killed, uh, it was necessary to disinfect uh, the place uh, so that uh, the, um, as the commander said, the sanitary conditions should be maintained. And as soon as the Jew was buried, his uh, teeth were uh, taken out if there were any gold teeth. Do you remember a case of a man named Bitter. Uh, uh, this was an oh, incident I which I remember quite well. I will never forget it, that I can assure the court. Bitter, in the course of his work, fell down and uh, uh, some uh, money from uh, his uh, pot fell down and then the overseer saw it. Who was the master, the his meister? The name of this meister was Mars. He reported uh, on it to the commandant and the commander first of all uh, beat him and then said uh, this man ought to be hanged and indeed he was hanged but the rope was rather flimsy and was torn uh, so bitter dropped down but still alive then Fikes decided that perhaps it would be necessary to hang him again and it is a pity to waste a bullet for a Jew and he said uh, among other things the Jews themselves have to finish him off. They have to kill him. And then he ordered a roll call of 2,000 Jews. Uh, we, uh, the doctors were also there. There were some more doctors. And the Ukrainians gave each Jew a stick. And the Jews had to beat him up. He had to run the gauntlet, as it were. He had to run around, and three Ukrainians were pushing him on so as to see that he was really beaten by the Jews. And each time when uh, this man was running around, he was saying, I take it with love. If I have to be the victim for the welfare of the people of Israel, I take it readily and with enthusiasm. In the end he fell, and the commander called me so that I should find out whether he was still alive or not, and in a very weak voice told me, I have no remorse. 
Ani Kaparabat Ami. I do not, I am not in pain, Doctor. I am the scapegoat for all the Jewish nation. And I take it with love. Please read the Kaddish after my death. I don't know how long afterwards, a few minutes or perhaps half an hour. We were not allowed to give him water or anything. Um, and then he uh, passed away. What formation did Reinhold fight belong S to? S -man. He was Oberscharführer. And during all these atrocities, you remember a special case with one of Fight's assistants, Clavin. I remember full well. He was the right hand man of Fikes. He came from Latvia. He was one of the greatest sadists. Uh, all of them were sadists, but he was one of the greatest of them all. Uh, one, uh, once at night, he brought to the hut uh, some prostitutes. And he would uh, uh, lie with them in the presence of all the Jews. And there were also children who had to behold the scene. Fathers and sons. Fathers and sons were yes, present. Yes, fathers and sons were in the hut. There were also small children in the hut. Uh, uh, there were ch children aged 11, 12, 13. You remember the case of Bauchwitz? Fikes had already left the camp, uh, that labor camp, uh, and uh, we had been there already for two months, those who came from Maidanek, more or less two months. I understand that, I, I remember he left uh, in June, and his uh, deputy uh, was uh, a Ukrainian, uh, Oberwachtmeister, he was commander of the Ukrainian camp. At any rate, one of uh, those days, when uh, the inmates came from back from work, one apparently had fled, and at the head of the group there was a man called Bauchwitz. This was a man from Stettin in Germany. His family, as we found out, uh, had uh, got converted when he was six years old. And when that inmate had run away, uh, Bauswitz did not inform the commander about it because he knew that if he informed uh, the commander about it, uh, ten people would be killed. President of court, what did he not inform he didn't to the commander? He report to the commander that one Jew had run away. And then uh, it transpired uh, later on at the roll call, and the commander decided to hang him. He uh, decided to hang Bauchwitz. And then he said, I have only one request. And the commander said, well, get it off your chest. I was a German officer in the First World War, and I was fighting at Verdun. Of all the battalion, only several people survived. And I was conferred the Eisenhower's Kreuz first class. And as such, I should like to request you to be shot and not hanged. And Wachmeister answered, if you have an iron cross, whether you were an officer or not, for me, you are a stinking Jew and you're going to be hanged. 
and then he would go to the gallows and uh, ask to say a few words uh, to the Jews in the camp. And this was permitted. And then he said, I was born as a Jew, and what I remember from my Jewishness is one prayer, and I remember only the first words of that prayer, and they are uh, Elohei Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, uh, the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. It is all I remember, but I'm dying as a Jew, and I request you, Jews, uh, uh, tell a doxology after I die. Uh, tell the Kaddish when I'm no more. Do you remember the end of October 43 when you first... Doctors, occasionally they exchange a few words with us, <laughs> and one saw me and told me, uh, he said that we were lucky. What is uh, the luck, I ask? What is the nature of it? And then he replied that this was the only camp uh, whose inmates uh, had survived because Reich Marshal Goering gave an order to leave that camp intact as an important factory for the war effort, effort the so-called Kriegswichtige Betrieb, against the will of an expert in Jewish questions, Eichmann. This is what he said. Contrary to the wish of the yes. expert in Jewish affairs, Eichmann, when was I that? I can't say exactly when it was, but I think it was about a week or a fortnight uh, after the 5th of November, they say after uh, those people had come back from Majdanek. This was the first time you heard Eichmann's no, name? No, this was not the first time. This was only already the second time I heard about Eichmann. Several months before that, I do not remember exactly when, but this was after Fikes had already left. Uh, so it couldn't have been before July. A Jew came to our camp, a Jew called Karp, who had run away from Sobibor. And he related that uh, one of those days, two high-ranking officers had visited Sobibor, and he said that Sobibor was uh, one great uh, gas uh, chamber where Jews were burned. He said the two high-ranking officers came to that camp uh, to see to it uh, whether the crematorium is operating properly. And the Ukrainians who were there told the Jews that these uh, two high-ranking officers were Himmler and Eichmann. Then uh, you heard Eichmann's name twice during the war. Did you hear the name again? Yes, I heard again this name. Yeah. President of court, is uh, this uh, an evidence which is more direct than the two previous witnesses? I remember once again uh, this part in the testimony of another witness. in connection with the mentioning okay. of the name of the accused. Attorney General, we are nearing the end of this testimony. President of Court, I stress once again, in connection with the mentioning of the name of the accused, not the entire testimony. Attorney General, I will ask the court at the end to draw certain conclusions that Eichmann's name was a password amongst inmates of camps. This could not have been accidental. In order to tell the court how it happened for the third time, I have to make a brief introduction. Our camp, uh, say our labor camp, Budzin, had been transformed in January 1944. 
Uh, then we say the 15th of Shvat, according to the Jewish calendar, into a concentration camp. And we were transferred from the labor camp about two or three kilometers away to a new place, but they also called it uh, Budzin, concentration camp Budzin. There we had pajamas already because in the labor camp we had uh, civilian clothes. And it was possible, therefore, that from time to time uh, another Jew would enter the camp, even if he was an inmate. Uh, uh, so, as I was saying, in the new camp I was working in a disinfection center. Uh, this was called uh, Bade and Entlausung Anstalt. We say the Delausing and Bath Institute. We were working there, and um, 12 Jews, among whom two rabbis, two rabbis from um, Warsaw. One of them, I understand, lives in Israel now. And to that uh, center, very often Germans would come. And in 1944, even German soldiers from the Russian front would come uh, from the front in Tarnopol in order to uh, wash and uh, get cleaned. Uh, this was on the 5th of May, 1944, a Friday. A, civilian, a German civilian entered. I had never seen him before. He was extremely tall and very sturdy. He was called Ober Belschutz Billy. Uh, his uh, family name was Miller or Meltzer, I do not remember exactly. At any rate, he was Ober Belschutz at the time when the place was a labor camp. What he did later on, when the camp had been converted into a concentration camp, I do not know. Uh, may I lead you, Dr. Berinsky? I understand that this Willie uh, started a conversation with you asking how many Jews were in camp. Um, on that day, I examined about 30 Jews who had been treated in, against scabies. And after being provocated, you said that you were proud to be a Jew. Is that correct? Yes. And then he answered, that only a German may be proud of his race and started beating you and said that he already killed 700 Jews. Uh, he uh, took a notebook. Yes, he took out a notebook and, and said he killed 700 recorded how many people he'd already with his own hands and that you would be number 701. Uh, he, rifle me. he beat me with his rifle butt towards the place where Jews were they killed. They told me that I had to go, and he put the uh, muzzle on my uh, neck, and he brought me together with a big dog, and all the time he was instigating the dog against me. The dog was very well trained. When he heard, at the sound of the word Yuda, he would uh, bite uh, the victim, and he was biting me all the time, uh, but about 100 meters uh, from the place of the destination where the Jews were shot. He always shot the Jews uh, individually so that there should be no witnesses. Then in the last moment, as I was saying, as as a Hoffman came, accompanied by two other men, uh, and uh, uh, actually he should have been together with us uh, during the work, but as we heard, they went to the neighboring town to have a good time, to have a drink. At any rate, uh, in the last moment, he saved me. Uh, I was bleeding. He saw my condition. And uh, for about a day or two, he visited me in the uh, camp. I must say that uh, 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 out of the group of uh, murderers, uh, he behaved in a relatively human manner. He was not born in Germany, actually he was born in Hungary, 
Uh, he was a Schwab. He helped me. He visited me in order to see what my situation, my, what my condition was, and he said, "You are going. You are going to survive." This is the second time that you had cheated death, as it were. And uh, he said, as this is the second time, you will certainly uh, be uh, saved. The first uh, time, he said, I was not there, but I remember the case. This was in the labor camp Budzin, that uh, all of you had to be killed. And he added, uh, more or less in the following terms, he said it, that the contents was as follows. Uh, he said that the Reich Marshal gave the order, say Goering gave the order to leave uh, the inmates intact, and uh, the Germans who were working there said that without the Jews, it would be impossible for them to operate uh, the factory, and uh, if the Jews are not there, the factory would have to close down. He said this was actually against the will of a high-ranking officer whose name is Adolf Eichmann. This is what Hoffman said. Now, two last questions. When you were in Budin in 1944, before the Pesach,